You're listening to Kayak Flyer with your host, Sean. Tonight, we're brought to you by Tennessee Trailers, OutdoorAdventureTrailers.com. Simply the best way to get your kayak to and from the water. Bajuco Flats Flyco. Simply the best custom-made fly rods on the market. Always built to order just the way you want it. Find Bajuco Flats Flyco on Instagram and Facebook. Stoneflynets.com, made 100% in the great state of Arkansas with your choice of woods or burls. Stonefly Nets can even be customized for that favorite fisher person in your life. Check out Stoneflynets.com for details. Cutthroatfurledleaders.com, the only leaders that I fish with. Cutthroat furled leaders are excellent for saltwater, freshwater, trout, bass, you name it, you can catch it with a Cutthroat Furled Leader. Head to Cutthroatfurledleaders.com, promo code kayak to save 15%. You know, I want to thank all those great sponsors that help with the show. And I also want to tell you to check out 19 Delta Bait and the Essential Outdoorsman. Those guys have a great podcast. And 19 Delta Bait is the home of great soft plastics and custom crankbaits. Tonight, I'm here with Andrew. And, Andrew, you've been on the show before, but you were nice enough to come back. As yep. fishing season's getting ready to gear up and, you know, you being a professional guide up in Alaska, that's got to be exciting. Yep, we are all geared up. Um starting to get go through all my uh gear and get all that ready um i'm pretty excited not guiding this year in alaska has really kind of um kind of put it in uh i guess you'd say perspective as of how much i really have missed it so much so i'm i'm super pumped and super excited to get back up there um i know a lot of guides that i've been talking to and keeping in touch with that i work with they're already in gun ho um i told my boss i'd go up right now and guide if he'd let me so <laughs> That's got to be pretty chilly up there now, but how soon can, will you guys start? When will your season open? Our season will open, uh, let's see, about, I think it's June 1st will be our first clients, and then we will end October 3rd. So we're going a little bit longer season than we normally have, but we are completely booked from day one to the very last day there. So, um, so we're... that's pretty exciting that we have a full book. Yeah, I so. mean, already to have a full book this many months out and knowing, you know, after last year and a lot of people didn't get to go on the trips they wanted to go on, you know, it's a really got to be a great feeling to know that you're going to be able to have those clients up to enjoy Alaska this year. Yeah, it's uh, it's really excited. A lot of them, uh, I've kept in touch with a few of them, sending emails back and forth. They're all super excited and like super raring to go. Um I have an email from one client. He said, I got a brand new fly rod and everything for this next season. He's like, I didn't even need it. He's like, I just bought it because I wanted it. So I'm like, well, we'll break it in. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it always, you know, I always get excited when I'm getting ready to go on a trip or something and, and looking at, do I need this? No. Do I want it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. The most dangerous thing in the world is the fly shop. Cause you, you always go in and it's like, I may not need anything in there, but I'm going to find something I want. <laughs> yeah. And if it's not a rod or reel or something like that, if you tie flies, I've come to the yeah. conclusion, buying supplies to tie and actually tying them are totally different. Yeah. You know, I've got more stuff here than I know what to do with for tying, and I tie the same eight flies most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> I have so many boxes of just rabbit fur and deer hair and everything else that I'm like, man, you know, I'm like, I tie maybe for around here and for guiding. There's about eight to ten flies that I stick to that are my kind of my bread and butter I know they all work. They work great. And then I'm like, I got so many material for different stuff that I'm like, I'm not going to use this. <laughs> like, it's, it's kind of a racket. It really is. But, you know, eventually I will sit down and go through it all. And I'm like, well, I can tie up this one too. So might as well. <laughs> yeah. And I like those days where it's, I really want to throw this fly because I want to see how it works. But I really want to catch fish. So I'm going to use the fly I know works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, a very... um kind of the old question there is uh you know do you stick with what works or try something different that might work a little bit better so yeah but that is you know you never know until you try it and it's you know those confidence flies that we all have but getting out there yeah. and trying something different and talking about confidence having confidence in a guide is something you've got to have I mean you're going to a place that you've never been before and I've been guilty of it I've gone to 
you know, the coast, and I've never been there before, and I'm going to try to fish, and some days it works out, some days it doesn't, um, because I don't know the water. But being a yeah. guide, that's something that everybody really needs to understand, is you're out there every day, you know where to go and what to do. Yeah, we, I mean, for most guides, uh, you pretty much live on the water, even on days off. Like when I'm up there, especially I'm going out, I'm looking at new, not even necessarily fishing, but I'm looking at new spots. I'm watching to see where fish are laying at, maybe see where they're resting. Um, you always find a neat little spot or you might see a trout that you didn't think was there. And um, a lot of times we'll run the boat in certain areas, you know, just to kind of spook fish out just to see where, you know, maybe they where they went or where they go to when they get spooked or something. So um most guides are on water all the time just checking out everything um i know one guy down actually towards arkansas he uh doesn't guide as much anymore as he used to but he will set up two days the day before he goes guiding to go out and check the water and the day after to go out and check it and see if was it a fluke um did they actually hook that fish did they lose that fish for a reason um were they just tossing the wrong stuff or what really happened there so you know that's a big thing within when it comes to guiding is really being out there as much as possible. Um, I tell people all the time, it's the only job where, you know, an off day you go fishing, but it's also a work day because you're trying to see where everything's at. So Yeah, you've really got to enjoy it. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand how much education and training goes into becoming a guide and different guide schools that are out there. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience with that? So the guide school I went to is Sweetwater Travel. Um, they do a seven-day course in Montana. They either do it on the Yellowstone or the Bighorn, depending on weather conditions and time of year. Um, and they go everything from tying knots to um, how to handle certain clients in certain situations, uh, working on the boat, CPR and first aid training. Um, you know, they'll go out there, and uh, I remember this very vividly. Um, the one guide that I had in the boat was when we were practicing running the jet boat. Um, he just kind of, he's sitting there all quiet, like, and I'm running up river. And next thing I know, he throws the uh, life vest out there and he's like, Oh, there's your client just fell in. Got to go grab it right now <laughs> before he drowned. <laughs> and you're kind of like unexpected this. And it's like, well, that's kind of some of the stuff that happens. You'll have clients, you know, the hat flies off or they'll fall in, you know? Um, and then you got to think really quick on, you know, how to react to that situation. So, most guides nowadays have had some sort of training in that situation, uh, whether it be guide school or through the Coast Guard. Um, I had to get a Coast Guard license to run waters in Alaska, and that's a three-day course for the Alaskan Coast Guard license, just going over every little thing um, from hypothermia, how to treat it, survival. I mean, everything. They have You have to take a mariner's oath, and so it's it's pretty intense just to – be able to guide in some areas so other areas are a little bit more relaxed in their guiding depending on the waterways but uh, for the most part um, I know saltwater guides have to have like over 365 days on water proof that they've been on water before they can even start going for their license so yeah, yeah and uh, each one's a little bit different I mean it's definitely got to be different in Alaska as it is on a river in the continental United States you know um say whether it be montana or arkansas or wherever and then getting out into the salt water around the coast and the east coast and, and the pacific that's that's a whole nother bag of worms that people have to get into so being able to yeah. transition from one place to another is a lot more difficult but if you're targeting the same species i would guess that there would be some of the tactics to getting the fish on that are very similar yeah, there's there's quite a bit of overlap in a lot of areas. Um, for instance, I'll I'll use this. So when I was out in Montana this summer, a lot of the flies that I would throw back here for the brown trout, we were throwing similar flies out in Montana, even down to the same color patterns. Um, brown and yellow is one of my all-time favorite colors to throw in just about any fly for brown trout, and it's you know from Montana to here to new york state i know a lot of guys that like that color combination it, whether it be for deer hair or rabbit they will throw that fly because they have a great deal of confidence in that because there is quite a bit of overlap so and then you know with a lot of fish they're predators so they're going to sit in somewhat similar areas so 
Yeah, I've noticed a lot um, of times when I'm fishing outside of parks or in, in streams that they can actually reproduce in, there's a big difference in how those fish act, especially those trout. They, they almost ambush hunt a lot more than you would expect them to. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. From park hatchery fish to actually getting out. So um, use this Montauk State Park, uh, which is not that far from uh, either one of us, actually. Um, you go below that to the current river, and that's considered Blue Ribbon Trout Stream. Uh, they actually have a breeding population of brown trout in there. Um, so how from how the fish lay in the park to just going outside of the park is completely different. Um, yeah, yeah. I went up there, and I spent the past uh, – this past week, uh, five days up there fishing that river. And, um, it's been a while since I've been up to that area and it was, yeah, I kind of got my butt kicked. There was a couple days I got skunked pretty hard. <laughs> um, just, yeah, it's, um, it's completely different from hatchery fish to wild fish. Yeah. I, I so, um, I find that hatchery fish will lay a little bit more in open water and they just kind of sit there and wait for stuff to come to them. Whereas a wild fish actually knows how to ambush stuff and everything. So, yeah. And I think, I mean, I prefer that fishing for them, that ambush style where I yeah. know to throw around rocks. I know to throw around ledges. I know to throw underneath logs. It's a lot like fishing for smallmouth bass or even largemouth bass um, because they are at that predatory mode. Um, it seems like you can get away with a little bit bigger flies doing that too sometimes. <laughs> Um, because yep. the movement's going to grab them first. The color's really going to come in later on. It's that movement and presentation because they've just got a split second as it comes past that rock as they bolt out mm -hmm. to nail it. And it's it's really a lot of fun if you can get away and, and fish like that. Yes, um, completely agree with you there. Um, so when I was up there, yeah, I actually had, there was a few people that had come up to fish the park and they decided after because the park's only open three days during the winter, they were going to fish the outside. And I was throwing this big double articulated D and D and they're like, what are you fishing for? I'm like, I'm fishing for trout. They're like, that's too big. I'm like, no, they'll hit it. <laughs> like they, they will definitely go for this fly. And, um, and especially when you get into those bigger fish, that 18, 19, 20 inch range, a lot of times those fish, I think people forget from going from the park, to wild trout is that they kind of start to be more um i guess uh, what's the word i'm looking for um they'll eat a lot bigger meals as far as crayfish they kind of go away from the bugs so much because you know it's um would you rather take a plate of fries or that big steak that's coming towards you concept, yeah so. i think that's what a lot of people when we start talking about the really big flies i know like gallop and some of those guys tie those really big monster streamers yeah. And it's like, these fish are conserving energy. They don't want to move yeah. two feet for a scud when they can move three feet for a mouse. Yep. You know, and exactly, and that makes a huge difference in what you're going to catch. And, you know, on, on the nice summer days, you have floating a terrestrial down on top water, you know, a, a hopper, great way to do it, you know. But, yeah. man, when it gets really hot and that water temperature moves up and they're really conserving energy, you know, throwing a piece of meat past them seems to work really well. Um, how big a meat do you guys throw up in Alaska? Well, I think more so up there, I'm going for weight, just okay. getting down deep to where a lot of them are. But I'd say the biggest one we throw is we throw this one Dalai Lama, and it's about <laughs> it's a good three or four inches, but it has the Alaskan cone head on it, which is this monster cone head. And I – Geez, I don't even know how much it weighs, but people will throw it on a seven weight. They're like, should I have my 10 weight on this? I'm like, you think, but you'd be pulling it out of their mouths. I mean, yeah. it's just a huge, heavy fly, but, and it gets down super deep. Um, a lot of times those fish are sitting really low up there, especially, um, especially in the bigger rivers that I find. Um, Cause they got bears, eagles, everything's after them. So yeah, that's, being, that's the thing is keeping them out of the eagles you know yeah <laughs> from that's... everything i've seen um uh, there's a place of brooks falls up there we go bear viewing and i've actually seen a bear up there take a rainbow out of the water <laughs> but surprisingly <laughs> enough, what i what i thought was the weirdest thing is he spit it out instantly he caught it and let it go and like the fish was dead as it was going down river but he will throw it out to go after the salmon more oh really yeah 
Uh, and I've seen a few dead dollies in that river before. Um, but yeah, they won't eat them, but they will catch them every now and then. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's got to be a mind bender to be out there and the the bears are right there. Yeah, that is uh, – it's, uh, it's kind of something that I would uh, – it's something that's always at the back of your mind – uh, but also a lot of times, you know, you're, you get, it's very easy to get distracted from that. They're always there. Cause then you, you see them so much and then you're just like, Oh, they don't do anything. Um, and then you get distracted and next thing you know, he's four foot in front of you and you're like, Oh, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what happens, have, what happens in those situations? Uh, the biggest thing is to make sure they know your presence there. Make sure that they know that you're there. We do a lot of hollering, uh, slowly backing away. Um, if I'm with a couple of people, I'll get them together in kind of a group. And so kind of make us look a little bit bigger. And we'll slowly just give them as wide a berth as possible. But make sure that they know that we know that they're there and everything, just so you don't scare them or anything. Have and you, definitely don't run. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had to use, like, bear mace or anything? Have you ever had a call that close? I've pulled it out, um, but I've never actually had to use it. And the only reason I pulled it out once um, up there, and she was far enough away that normally I wouldn't have – been as anxious as i was uh but the two people i was guiding was two smaller children that was 13 and 14 yeah and they were very much freaking out and like where's our dad i'm like he's up river we're gonna just back up river um i was very concerned that they were gonna try to take off running and not listening to me right so i just wanted to have that kind of ready and able for when that happened but um that was midsummer. Uh, it was a big sow. She actually came out, laid right down in the water. It was the hottest record uh, in 2019 for heat, and she was so covered in sweat. Like when she laid down in the water, you just heard her just exhale from, like, I'm finally cool. I'm not moving at all. Yeah. So <laughs> she could have cared less, but it was more of if these kids run, they could trigger her to do something, and that was more my concern there. Yeah. So, do you see but, any problems with the? Uh... People coming up there, uh, I, I don't want to use the word harassing, but, you know, being around the bears, I know, you know, you go anywhere around the Smoky Mountains and whatnot, and it's do not feed the bear, do not do this, do not do that, and people just don't always, they don't always realize just how mean those things are when they get used to being fed. Yeah. I don't see it as much of a problem up in Alaska, Um most of the residents know how the bears are. Um, and then a lot of places that they do bear viewings, um, you never really get outside of a ranger. Like even if they have ranger towers, I know at Brooks, there was rangers all along the trail that we were walking. Um, there was a bear crossing and the ranger said, hold up, stop. We're going to wait till this bear gets out of the way. Then you guys can keep walking on. Um, there was an extreme amount of rangers. So there wasn't really given much of an opportunity for people to be negligent around them that I see more in the lower 48. You know, you see all the videos on like YouTube of stuff of people being so close to bears. Um, I just watched a video recently that I'm like, this guy was crazy. Um, he had a black bear walk up in camp between him and the fire and it sniffed his knee and then bit his knee like a dog would. <laughs> and like he freaked out and jumped back. I'm like, that's like, you're going to get eaten in that point right there. Like you, you let it walk up to you. Yeah. So um, I see that. Yeah. It's a much bigger problem in the 48 and like around the smoky mountains and uh, a lot around like Yellowstone park. I was out there this summer and a lot of those people, especially when it came to the bison were just, I was like, man, these, these guys are going to, you know, they're going to die one of these days from these things. Cause they keep trying to pet them and everything else. So yeah, when the, I like the ones where everybody's stopped in traffic and there's a herd of bison and you've got the one guy on the motorcycle who's filming to the left and a one comes out of the right and just smokes the bike, you know, yeah. it's like, that's a bad day, man. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think sometimes we don't, I guess, appreciate the wildlife around us. Yeah. And, and respect it. I know now we're going to have a bear season here in Missouri. There's a bear season already, a, a pretty healthy bear season down in Arkansas. Um, and so when I'm fishing around those places, I'm not worried about bears, but it's like, you know, they could yeah. be around here. 
Oh yeah, and they easily are. Like I've I've had bears. Um, just uh, this past deer season, I had a bear walk underneath my deer stand. Um, I had just climbed up in it, and no more than five minutes, it was just barely enough light that I could see it, and it came walking right through, right underneath my deer stand, and from where it came from was the same area I was walking. I'm like, he probably was just like right behind me and I never heard it. And that's another thing that people don't get with uh, a bears and especially up there. Um, I've had them, you know, walk uh, probably no more than three foot from me up in the grass. And I never heard it until I was got to looking around. I'm like, that's that track wasn't there. That's on top of my boot print. Um, they have like a two inch thick pad underneath them. So, um, that's yeah. why a lot of people wear bells and stuff, especially up in Alaska when they're on the rivers, they'll have bells on their shoulders and everything, just constantly making noise. So Yeah, it's it's just something you've gotta you've gotta be aware of. And yeah. it's I mean, I don't think a bear wakes up of a morning looking to get somebody, but the scary thing is getting between a sow and a cub. Yep. You know, that's the um, really scary one. Yeah, uh, we had uh, one of the guides I work with, he had a very close call with that. Um, he was on this little bitty stream uh, going upriver, um, which is barely big enough, is big enough to run a boat on, but you really had to know what you were doing just due to the size of the uh, stream. And as he came around a bend, he said, I was looking up at this tree, and he's like, that's weird, that tree's moving. And by the time he realized it was a cub inside the tree, he looked straight down and like no more than five foot in front of him, was the mother sow and he literally had to bank the boat um jump out try to push it off the bank the sow was uh like hoofing at him she kept throwing her paws up in front um it was the as he said it was the closest time he's like i've came to spraying and he's like looking back i should have sprayed he's like but i was more like we're going to get the boat and we're going to get out of here as fast as possible he was just trying to shove the boat off the gravel bar so um you know, I mean, it, it easily happens, especially with sows early springtime. They are out there. They're fresh from their dens, and these cubs are very small, so they are way more protective of them. Yeah, and, I mean, that's probably not something you go over in guide school. That's probably something you get with experience and working up in Alaska, I would imagine. But I would think that there would be a lot of guides that, you know, have to understand what a priority safety is for their clients when it comes to wildlife. Yeah. Um, when I first went up to Alaska and then with Sweetwater Travel, they do talk about bears somewhat, um, especially for because they have a lot of guys that are going up to Alaska to take the class. Um, they go over bear safety a little bit. But then when I got up there, a lot of the older guides would tell me, here's what you do. Here's what you need to worry about. Um, and a few of them had had close calls. So, you know, it's the lodge itself usually goes over with their guides exactly what you need to do and what to do in this situation. So, and then we never go out guiding without bear mace on us. Um, I know a few guides that carry shotguns, uh, rifles or pistols, uh, some sort of safety measure on there. So, yeah, I mean, that would be, I mean, you're in the water where the, you know, like you said, the bears yeah. are fishing too, you know, and everything's coming there to drink. It's a hot spot for picking up hunting as far as other animals and you know stuff that's going to grow next to that water for food sources you know it's it's it, i guess it could be a little nerve-wracking yeah it, it can be and then like when our clients first get there we go over um especially at our lodge we'll have a sunday dinner and they go through this speech of like what this week's going to be like what um everything and then there's a bear speech at the end um we also tell our clients you know a lot of times you know we're tying you up a new fly rig if we're tying that up you know feel free to keep an eye out if we see something that you know or you see something that i don't see just let me know ahead of time you know so we can get prepared so and most of our clients are are really good about that and a lot of them stay really vigilant so you know you got three people being vigilant on the water it just helps out a lot so yeah yeah and not to scare people away from fishing in alaska <laughs> oh no <laughs> i definitely wouldn't scare anyone like it, it is an an amazing state to fish in uh fishing unlike anywhere i've ever been at um but it yeah just i i tell anyone going up to alaska next year or this year now um just you know keep that in mind and keep vigilant and definitely bring bear mace with you because that stuff it is so powerful it'll stop anything <laughs> yeah. and you know we were talking about um 
we never did name the resort that you're at. If you want to go ahead and give them a plug, even though they're booked up, if people want to book for 2022. Yeah, it's the Royal Coachman Lodge. Um, you can find it on Sweetwater Travel's website, along with all the other lodges that they have. They have one in Brazil, uh, Mongolia. Uh, there's another one down in the Bahamas. So, uh, But I work for the Royal Coachman. And then we have the Copper River Lodge, um, both amazing lodges up there. Um, but, yeah, just hop online, give us a shout. Uh, Pat Vermillion, his email's on there. Um, just tell him Andrew sent you. So. <laughs> so do you get a chance to go to some of those other lodges and work a little bit like the bahamas might be nice this time of year i would love to go to the bahamas um i have i've mentioned that before like hey i'll go to one of these other lodges if you need somebody um unfortunately a lot with like the uh the bahamas um you have to be bohemian to guide down there oh yeah that i forgot about that that's uh that's a an odd law that they've got so that outsiders don't come in yeah, and there's some people, I know a few people are grandfathered in to different areas. Um, I do get a lot of that area. It's to help um, people in that area and the impoverished areas to go out and, you know, use these natural resources to get, you know, some money flowing in. So, when but you, it'd be. It's not a bad be, idea when you think about it, yeah. you know. No, um, it's the same for like a lot of parts of uh, America, too. It's very hard for foreigners to come over and guide in america itself too um so you know it, it we have our own laws too that make it hard for people to come up here um i know canada is another one you have to live you have to be a citizen of canada and live at least six months just before you start guiding into canada so yeah canada has some really odd I, i've got a friend who moved up there and she's lived up there i i couldn't even tell you how long but we were just talking about teachers and teacher salaries and yeah. she's like oh the teachers get paid really well here and we have you know you have to sub for like four years before you can get a job because there's no shortage yeah unlike <laughs> unlike america where there's a shortage every year yeah, yeah. so well, not in Alaska. They've always got teachers wanted up in Alaska. So <laughs> yeah, I mean that wouldn't be bad. You could guide all summer long, and then you could you know teach in the winter. Yeah, but... um, one of the pilots that I work with, uh, who did guiding, uh, also was a teacher up in Alaska. So you know, there's always that option up there, and Alaska is really good. The fact that they will almost pay for your college. Um, fresh college students wanting to go up there, they will pretty much pay for it if you want to come up there for so many years and teach. So, um, I know uh, one of my former teachers, um, he went out of high school and went to work on the pipeline in Alaska. I think he was there for seven years and he paid for his college in cash. Yeah. You know, because there, he, like he said, there was nothing to do. You didn't, yeah. you didn't spend any money. Yeah. yeah, you're, you're kind of there, and it's just like, oh, there's a rock we could stare at for a couple hours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm good. I love the fishing, and then um, – so I, I always have something to do up there. And then late season, we start bird hunting a little bit. So there's always something I can find to do up there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. How is – I've never really heard about the bird hunting in Alaska. How How is that? I do – we do a lot of grouse hunting around there. Just you – know, we don't offer that, but we, like, the guides themselves will go out on a day off and do that. It is it is so much fun up there. Um, very different because a lot of times the grouse will live on the tundra and you're walking through all this brush, and the tundra feels kind of squishy, almost like walking through snow. So um, a bird hunt back here where you come back and you're like, oh, this was a fun day. You come back from a bird hunt up there, and you're just like, I'm so tired. Let me sleep for, like, the next – five hours <laughs> but um, it's an extreme amount of fun i've never seen more ducks though in my life i went duck hunting up there last year and i've never seen so many ever yeah um, i have videos of one uh that we did as we were driving down river and it just looks like something out of a movie there were so many thousands of ducks and yeah it was crazy but it was a lot of fun you know alaska just i mean it just seems so remote for most of us We've seen TV shows. I mean, there was that movie with uh, Pacino and uh, Robin Williams where it's like 3 o'clock and the guy's like, well, let's go to the school and interview the witness. And like, it's 3 a.m. <laughs> you know, but it looks like 3 in the afternoon. And those summers have got to be – do the and I, again, I just 
me being curious, did the clients ever wake up at like three in the morning and be like, oh, it's ready to go. The sun's out. Oh, yeah. I've, we've had that happen before. Um, you know, they'll tell us at breakfast. They're like, well, I woke up at, you know, such and such time and it was daylight and I couldn't fall back asleep. So I just sat up reading a book or something. And then uh, I woke up one morning and I was walking down and I see one of them. And he's out there fishing. He's like, well, I woke up at four. And, you know, everyone's asleep, so I decided to go fishing right off the dock here and, you know, seeing what I couldn't catch. I'm like, oh, well, sounds awesome. (laughs) I mean, I I guess, do you guys keep normal hours up there, or is it just sort of if you want to stay out and fish until 9 o'clock at night, you stay out and fish? We keep normal hours. Um, We kind of go by a strict, you know, breakfast at the lodge, you'll have lunch out on the river, then you're back here for supper, um... Due to there is some flying laws, even though it's daylight, um, there's uh, kind of it's I'm not for sure 100 percent if it's an actual law or if it's more of a guideline. No flying past midnight or something. Um, It may be daylight, but a lot of people don't do it up there. Um, So, you know, we kind of tell them if you want to fish after dinner, um, you're more than welcome to. Here's the kind of safety region. You need to stay right in here in this area. I've had some that, you know, after dinner we get back or we're the first plane back and they're like, well, could we do some fishing right here? I'm like, okay, I'll take you out and we'll go out and we'll do a little bit of fishing just right before dinner or they'll go out right after dinner and fish by themselves just right off front of our dock. So, and that's, you know, nice because it kind of keeps them there inside of us. We can keep an eye on them, make sure, you know, nothing happens and they get a little bit more fishing in. So, yeah, I know that's what I like when I'm on a, a trip like that. It's, You know, when I get back to where I'm staying, say we take the kayaks out into the bay and we go fishing all day and then we come back and we eat dinner, lay around for about an hour. And then it's like, well, let's just go fish off the dock out back for a little bit. Um, Yeah. And so it gives you sort of a full a fuller day feeling without having to be out and gone. And you can still get to bed at a reasonable hour to get up the next morning. Yeah. So, yeah. Talking about the plains, that's a big deal up in Alaska with the bush pilots. Yes, um, they are pretty much. How how do I want to put that? They uh they are one of our most important people on there. Everybody's important at our lodge, but uh, the bush pilots are very important from checking the weather of a morning, um, seeing where we can fly, where we can't fly. Uh, every morning they get on the computers, check for fog, wind, everything like that. Um, and it's a lot of fun, you know, talking with them and everything. You kind of get the idea of what they're all watching as far as forecast for the week. You know, they check that and let us know, hey, this day might be a little bit spotty for getting to this location. This day looks amazing. So it's like, well, that's the day we're going to pick then to go to our more far regions because we're going to have a much clearer day and a little bit better flighting. Um, So they, yeah, they, we are constantly in talks with them about what the weather is doing and everything like that. And, um, a lot of them have 30, 40 years of experience up there, so they've seen a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of the pilots up there now, especially uh, the old timers, were guides themselves. So they always know the, like, well, this little spot, you know, 20 years ago held some monster fish, you know, might be worth this, you know, another look see. And it's like, okay, let's try that on the way back and see what we can't do there. So. And these guys are all real pilots. It's not like Bullinger County, Missouri, where you've got a 15-year-old, no. you know, who's been driving a tractor for, you know, 20 years. No, these are all 100% real pilots. Um, there's a few of them that I've met up there that are like, yeah, well, I've been flying since I was 15. You know, when we moved up here and dad was like, here, take the fl- plane, we're going to fly. But all of them are fully licensed um, and everything. Uh, one of our mechanics, he's been uh, – I forget how old he was started when he was flying and working on planes with everything, but he was super young when he started and he's just like, yeah. And then, you know, I kind of knew what I was doing and then took the tests and all that. They all, they go through a rigorous amount of testing and as far as licensing wise. So, you know, there's uh there's bold pilots and smart pilots, but there's never bold pilots and young pilots, but there's never, or no, I'm saying uh, that wrong. Yeah, a bold pilot and an old pilot. Yep, but never an old bull pilot. There exactly. you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I just, I just, I don't know. I mean, Alaska is just, you know, you see all these different things on TV, and it seems like everybody's got a plane, and it's like, okay, so is it just you don't get a driver's license, you get an airplane? 
<laughs> there's I you know I saw that and I'm like oh that's got to be dramatized when I went up there but there's so many people up there with pilot license and little bitty planes and all that and then they're all fully licensed and everything they're all legal to do so but I'm like you guys like does everybody have a license up here I'm like is this just kind of the natural order of things and the one guy I was talking to one time when I was up there at the bar he's like well yeah kind of you know if you want to go anywhere it's either you pay somebody else to take you or you eventually go out yourself. So, yeah, I'm just waiting for the Texans to learn about yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you want to go to San Antonio? Get in the plane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's going to, oh, that's, oh, I'm, I'm ready. I'd love to see that actually. That would be so exciting. Like, there we go. Well, you know how <laughs> wild Texans are to begin with. I mean, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's go fishing, jump in the plane, we'll fly down to the coast. You know, such yep. a such yeah, a giant sure. giant state to get across. Yeah, that that's that'd be very interesting to see. I would they they could make a TV show about that right there. So <laughs> Yeah, I know we've talked, you know, and it's of course none of us are going to do it because number one, none of us trust the other enough to be in a plane with them, but my little group <laughs> of friends were like, you know, if we had our own plane with pontoons, we could land oh. it right down there in southern Louisiana and just pull it right up to the dock where we're staying yeah. at, you know. And it, oh, there's so many places you could get to. Yeah, man. Oh, I would love that. There's so many places I would still go to in Missouri that I'm like, oh, that's a 10-mile hike to get to that and camp out. I'm like, I'll just land the plane on the river. There we go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, you know, that's that's my thought is it's just so much easier. Oh, you want to go down to Cotter for the weekend? They've got an airstrip down there. We'll be down there an hour yeah. and a half, you know. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, It'd be better than the four-hour drive I took to them just this past week. It was <sighs> That was a drive. <laughs> oh, yeah. How was the fishing down there? I did a little bit. Uh, I didn't do too much uh, just doing that. I didn't have a boat or anything, and I was just in waders. Um, I fished one of the creeks, and I had a few smallmouth come up and hit stuff, but uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was kind of – I was – more so looking around the area um, as far as job availability, and I'm debating about maybe making a move down that direction. Um, I know uh, a couple of guides down there um, that we could talk about, and Polly Ann was on the show. She knows several guides down there, and Cotter is becoming a very, very happening fishery for folks yeah. who don't want to go to Montana or Alaska. Yeah, and even as far as, like, fishing in the middle of winter, you know, um, December, you know, and all that, especially out in Montana, a lot of stuff freezes over. So, like, when I was out there, a lot of guys that I was meeting on the Yellowstone River were like, yeah, come December, we head to Cotter for, like, a month and a half to go fishing, you know. Like, everything's kind of frozen over, and you're just kind of looking for those open spots. So, you know, might as well head to the southern water where you can fish, you know, yeah. all year round. So, And the town of Cotter is just – interesting there's there's no bar you yeah. know um there's like one restaurant that closes at like two o'clock in the afternoon yeah you know <laughs> and you've got this massive influx of people there on that river and it's like guys if you would just open you know a pizzeria up yeah. here on the, around the corner but people have to drive 15 miles to mountain home or wherever they want to go to to get to get whatever it is and i know a lot of people do stay in mountain home because of the lake and the norfolk river and come to cotter but man, there are yeah. a couple little uh, Airbnbs down there that are just really nice for fishermen and stuff like that. It's it's really, I really enjoy it. I've been going there several, well, quite a bit lately. And the Buffalo River is there, so if you want to kayak in warm water, that's a great opportunity to fish for wonderful smallmouth bass. And then, like I said, you've got the White and you've got uh, the Norfolk right there. Yeah, it's a beautiful area. It's an amazing fishery. Um, you know not many places you can go out and the same fly that you can catch you know brown trout on you can catch largemouth smallmouth you know there's all these fish in the river so it's i really the more i read about a lot of the stuff and the more i go down there it is an amazing area to be in so um kind of leaning towards that area uh for making a little move down to and seeing what i can't do for the next couple of years down there so because then I could do winters down there and summers in Alaska. So. Oh yeah, and they're they're not they're not closed up in the winter time. Oh no, there's yeah. Um, when I was down there, I saw just as many boats on the river, you know, guiding as you know I see when early spring when I went down there. Um, 
Like there were, there was a bunch of guys out there and there was guys coming in and out of the fly shop. Like, Oh, I need this, this, and this, you know, they, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty amazing little area. So, um, I've always been really impressed. Uh, the natural state fly shop is a, is a great little place to stop into to, especially to gather information. Um, the guys down there know what's going on on that water. They can tell you exactly where to go and what to do. Um, it's just really been a, a fun place. And I think it gets overlooked quite a bit and I'm hoping that's going to yep. change. I mean, yeah, I would. Yeah. A lot of areas I feel like in the Midwest get very much overlooked. Um, you know, Cotter's one of them, but if you come up to Missouri, the 11 point river, mm -hmm. the current river, there's a lot of great fishing in this kind of whole Ozark area that a lot of people just completely miss by. Um, and like, as far as like competitive go, um, from going out to Montana, this is from like a, a guide standpoint. Um, the competitive that I saw, out in Montana, as far as guides, you know, helping other, you know, if you wanted to go out there and guide um, people helping you out, there's a lot less in Montana because it is so much competitive because everybody wants to be a fishing guide and everybody does it out there. Whereas if you go down to Arkansas, I was talking with guides, they were like, well, here's where you go to get your license. Here's where you can go to do this um, insurance. They're like, you need any help? Here's my card. Give me a call. He's like, I will walk you through everything you need to know. Um, even as far as one guy told me an area, good launch, uh, spot, he's like, it's a good area. You can catch fish right in here. It's a great spot to go, you know, fishing at and to get, start guiding clients at. And in Montana, a lot of these guys are like, nope, not telling you anything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, honestly, those guys are booked. Well, I know Ben Woodard, um, he literally, he's like, I want to come on the podcast, but I don't have time. You know, yeah. he, and he quit his day job. He was working, you know, eight, nine hours a day at a day job and then guiding because night fishing down there is a big deal for those big 30 plus inch browns. Yeah. A lot of guys will just guide at night. And he was doing that and he finally broke away on his own and he's got his own guide service down there. And, you know, he's, he's literally running two, three groups of people a day. And yeah. And it's not like, I mean, I know a lot of people would think, oh, I'm going to Arkansas to go trout fishing. It's going to be an inexpensive deal. Yeah. It's not. Um, no, you pay it, just as much. Yeah, it's. Down it's there Montana, so. Yeah, you're paying the same price for a guide as you would down in the salt, you know, up anywhere else in the, in the northwest. I mean, it's, but you're getting fish and you're getting yeah. good fish. Yeah. And, you know, like you see, I went into Dilly's, uh, Dally's fly mm -hmm. shop down there yep. and, you know, all the photos they have on the wall. Um, you know, you can't do that. A lot of places that, you know, you can go to a place and see that many big fish caught out of a river, um, quite as often as, you know, down in on the white and everything like that. Like they have a constant stream of big fish that are being caught in there, which is an amazing in itself to have anywhere you go. So, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing river. Um, and also not many places can you get, you know, 30 inch brown trout on a streamer that's like three articulations in it. And it's just massive. You know, um, I have a box in there and uh, I took it when I went out to Montana and the guys were like, are those pike flies or musky flies? I'm like, no, those those are trout flies. We throw those. And they're like, no, you scare the fish away with that thing. No. <laughs> Those, like, no, this, this is what gets them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's amazing to see some of the flies that people are, are throwing. It's it's just absolutely wild. And, you know, you'll go down there and you'll be watching and, you know, those drift boats will chug up the river and then they'll float back. And it's constant action as you're watching those guys go by. And yep. it's, it's really a special place if you're listening. All right, we had a little glitch there in the uh, – broadcast so we uh, managed to bring adam on um adam's most of the time with us um great guy if you haven't listened to him before go back and listen to some of the past episodes where he's with us and uh adam and andrew you guys have not been together before on the podcast and you know one of the things that andrew and i were just talking about you know just the guiding in general and you know the opportunities that guides have yeah yeah, no kidding. I'm sure, Andrew, for you with um, with where your guiding experience has led you and whatnot, you probably run into all kinds, don't you? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, just from different experiences to meeting people from different uh, countries, different backgrounds, um, from their career to just their, even their lifestyle in general. I mean, there's a lot of experiences that you get in guiding and uh, you get to see some places that, you know, a lot of these people are paying um, crazy amounts of money to go see. Well, you're getting paid to be there and to kind of experience it all things. So um, it's an extraordinary like an extraordinary experience yeah yeah no kidding i can only imagine um you know and i i just in that particular part of the world the types of obviously fly fishing that it that it entails or whatnot are you i mean surely everybody that's coming coming your way they've got some experience under their belt right like nobody's coming to you for a fly fishing guided trip and this is their first time picking up a rod like does that happen it does you'd be um i wouldn't say i say it's a good out of a group of 10 people if there's somebody new um at our lodge it, it's usually kind of they're either brand new to fly fishing or we've had people come up that are brand new to fishing just in general um they just decided you know they moved out west and they saw fly fishing and then they started a little bit here and there and then they're like well we're going to go to alaska and try it out so you know um you get a good mixed batch of people who you know, they go every weekend and then you get some people who are once a year and then you get somebody who's just like, well, it looked cool. So I decided why not? Let's give it a try. So yeah. um, it's usually like a lot of fun. Um, I really enjoy getting people uh, and uh, most guides that I work with that are brand new to fly fishing because they just they want to suck up every information of it. And um, they just they have such a good time. And it's really fun to see their progression through the week from not being able to make a cast at the end of the week, you know, they're like, well, could I do this? And you're like, yeah, you could do that easily. So, yeah. Yeah. Here I am thinking it's a big deal for me to, you know, pack up a couple of my kids and go for a three hour drive and go fly fishing. I'm not picking up and going to Alaska just because I got a wild hair. That's certainly yeah. not happening. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does take a, uh, a little bit of a, uh, well, quite a bit of revenue to, you know, uh, in the back pocket to be able to do, um, but I mean, that kind of depends more on your trip and where you're going at in Alaska. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's there's some people that are, you know, like I've just decided I'm going for it. Um, I met a guy up there uh, last year in the airport to um, he had uh, been working in New York for a long time. Uh, and then he just decided, you know what, I'm selling everything. I'm moving to Alaska and I'm just going to do hiking tours or something he's just like i'm done i'm going out into the wilderness and i don't care <laughs> so wow yeah wow, which i was yeah something yeah. amazing to do to yeah. drop everything and go someplace so yeah what's yeah. some etiquette people might want to follow with a guide guy well some um that's, that's a tough one there <laughs> uh tip your guess, guide uh, that's probably a big one right yeah, I guess the big thing to keep in mind with your guide is that, uh, you know, they're not out there on the water just, you know, kind of telling you to do whatever. You know, there's a reason behind everything that they're doing. They're not. They want to see you catch a fish just as much as you want to catch a fish. Um, I know with me, you know, and a lot of other guides I work with, you know, it's just as much fun seeing these people catch a fish as if I had a rod in my hand and I was catching them. Um so that's a big thing. I've seen a few people get, you know, kind of frustrated, you know, out on the water. Then they don't think their their guide is doing as much as he can when, you know, we we really are trying our utmost to get you on these fish. And um, sometimes the fish don't cooperate right. Um, as a buddy of mine would say, sometimes they just don't eat the fly correctly. And that, you know, that's the big thing. Uh, but the, the big thing I'd say is not to get so frustrated with your guide because you know that it doesn't help a lot of situations and when you're you know you're just out there getting frustrated on the water which it does happen though you know i mean it's fishing we've all been there when we get frustrated especially when you lose that big fish and you're just like i want to quit fishing <laughs> so but yeah i i i think about um i've had the opportunity to do a couple of guided trips but not anywhere up in Alaska, but it, you definitely have to go into it with an open mind, right? And just know that, you know, you obviously know those waters, you know the fish, but you can't guarantee anything. Yeah. You know, um, I kind of always, you know, it's always 
like been told to me and a like of a lot of other guys I work with is kind of keep expectations low, even though you're expecting a great day, even if you know that day is going to be awesome to never build it up to a point that you can't as a guide, you know, give them up to, cause you know, you never know what's going to happen on the water. Um, I've been to, you know, we've been fishing a spot and, you know, it was just one right after the other one day. And then the next day it was like complete crickets. Like the fish just kind of, picked up and left out so yeah definitely keeping an open mind when you go on a guide trip is a big thing so you know one of the guided trips i was on the guide was working i mean he was really working and we landed a couple of bull reds and then the next four or five casts we got sharks and they just ran and and cut the line with their teeth and you could see the frustration as he was going through hook after hook after hook bait after bait after bait and moving and you'd catch a fish and then the next time you'd throw out here would be the sharks again so that's i mean i know there aren't sharks there but it's got to be frustrating when you know you're going out there and it's just maybe you're getting a bite but it's not what you're targeting or it may be you know really small fish that are hitting when you're looking for the bigger ones i can only imagine there's some frustration that goes along with that trying to provide your best service to the client yeah. And that, that kind of goes back uh, on the guide a little bit is um, you can be frustration, but the, the real trick there is not letting your client know that you're getting frustrated. Um, Cause then they start to feel the frustration. Like, am I messing up? Um, which is, it's a difficult thing to do, you know, um, especially like when we have the sockeye spawn that happens up there and you got a, a hundred sockeyes out in the river and you're fishing for those rainbows and, um, then you get snagged on the sockeye's tail and they'll take you 200 yards up river. You know, they're pulling out backing and everything else. And then it pops off and breaks the line and you reel that back up where you get them all tied up. And then the first cast out, boom, another sockeye and he's down river another hundred yards. Um, so it, it gets very frustrating on the guide point, but um, the trick there is to not let them know that you're getting frustrated and to definitely make sure they know you're not, if you do, you're not getting frustrated with them. It's just, you know, that happens. So, yeah. um, I usually like when I try to guide, I try to, um, this is something I picked up from another guide is let them kind of know what the process of what you're doing is, is what's going on. Um, you know, so they kind of get more involved into it and they start to spot these fish and see these fish and they like, well, can we do it like this? And you're like, yeah, you can when you kind of bring them into what you're doing and what you're looking for, I find people start to understand it a little bit better and they, they have a lot more fun when they're doing it too. So. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. But is there a, um, um, a specific style of um, fly fishing that you prefer, whether that's streamer fishing or a specific species that you're maybe one you like to fish for more than others, or maybe one that you like to guide more than others guide more than others um from the guide standpoint um i absolutely love guiding uh, up in alaska for the uh dolly varden um they're beautiful fish especially when they get all colored up and they have bright red lips um i love guiding for just about anything but they they kind of have a very little special place um one of the first guide days i had was on uh mountain lakes and we were catching dollies we caught a few rainbows but it was mostly the dolly varden that we were going for so i i kind of think from a guide standpoint those always have kind of a special place for me um if i go out fishing i love streamer fishing um i'm a tried and true 365 days a year streamer fisherman if i can um just throwing something that big and you're you're getting the fish to move away from where it's comfortable like when you're fishing dry flies or nymphs they're kind of sitting in that run naturally feeding but when you're throwing a streamer you're getting them to chase away from their comfort zone to come out and just kill what's on the end of your line so i think that streamer fishing kind of is yeah i think it's just an amazing thing to be able to do to get that fish to come out from that log that he felt protected by into that two inches of water to eat your fly. So, yeah. Yeah. Even more gratifying too, when it's a fly that you yourself may have tied or put something into it, right? Like, you know, knowing that that it was all you that did all the work to pull that off. Yeah. When I go fishing, if uh, somebody uses one of my flies, I count every fish they, they catch as half of my, my catch. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, I've caught five and fish before and never landed one all day long. Yeah. <laughs> and then every fly that they lose, that's you know, that's a penalty. That's a that's a six pack in the cooler. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to start doing that. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's good. So crazy conditions up there, I'm sure, in Alaska, just wild weather. Anything you've been stuck in before while guiding or, you know, predicaments you've kind of had to maybe think on your feet and get out of? I'm, I'm sure it's just kind of crazy at times. It, it can be. It gets a little bit more crazy later on in the year. You have the, the kind of the cold fronts that are pushing in, uh, foggy mornings real bad, ice build up on the plains. Um Later season, the weather really starts to get like a little bit more, um, more dangerous being out. Uh, I should say, um, we've had like the most, I've never been stuck out there. There was a day where it came very close to being like, we barely kind of beat ahead of the, the uh, front that was coming in. And, uh, we had a bunch of fog pushing in the plane flew over, um, I hopped on the radio and this, we had only been fishing for maybe about two and a half hours, three. And he's like, you got to get back to the plane now before, uh, we're stuck here and we're not getting off the water tonight. Mm. Um, so then it was like, you know, you got to reel up quick. We got to get in the boat. We got to haul, get across this lake in a hurry. Uh, um, and then, you know, you're throwing stuff in the plane, getting the boats anchored up. So where they're safe and not going to, you know, move away. And then you're piling into the plane and, you know, we were all kind of scrunched in, didn't really have room to take off our gear or anything like that. We were just kind of sitting in the plane all crunched up and like, oh, let's, let's boogie back to the lodge here. Um, but that's always kind of in the mindset. Like if we're, if we're maybe seeing a day that uh, could be potential bad weather, um, we always have like a game plan in the back of the head with the pilots, um, you know, as far as flying over when the weather gets bad they're keeping an eye on everything. Um, then a lot of times we'll have like a little firewood kit inside the boat itself, you know, for a little campfire if it gets real bad and we're kind of stuck there overnight. So Yeah, that was going to be my question was do you keep like a tent and stuff handy in case that occurs? Uh, not a tent. We've, we've debated about that before. Um, it comes down to a wait for the plane issue there. Um, but firewood, keeping out there to keep warm. Um, in my guide bag, I keep a couple extra long johns, um, extra coats that are vacuum sealed up, uh, extra batteries for my walkie, um, stuff like that, just in case that I get stuck out there and we got to bundle up. Um, I also keep those little uh, uh, emergency little tin blanket things that they have, um, which work great. Um, I keep about four or five of those in my guide bag at all times, just in case, you know, we're out there overnight. Um, we've been very fortunate that we've never had that happen at our lodge. Um, there's been a couple of close calls where it was like, uh, this might be um, staying out overnight, but um, we've been very fortunate not to have had that happen. Yeah. So I always keep, uh, make sure I have at least two lighters in my kayak for, to, for starting a fire and just basic stuff, you know, a little bit of toilet paper, yeah. you know, <laughs> because okay. you never know when I the sun extra, might go yeah. down quick on you, you know, uh, I keep a couple extra rolls and we, and I usually tend to go through those throughout the year. Cause you always have, you know, somebody out on the river. It's like, um, you got toilet paper, right? I'm like, yeah, I got toilet papers. Like I'm going in the bushes. I'm like, well, here's an extra can of bear spray just in case <laughs> we'll right, right here. So, <laughs> but Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's crazy to think about all, all that goes into it, you know, clearly depending upon the environment, but man, so much more goes into, your, you know, what you're saying in your guide bag. It's not just a box of flies and a, a spare rod. I, there, there's just so much more you really have to think about for a worst case scenario. Yeah. And then, you know, you, we keep extra flares in there. Um, I have three flares that I carry at all times in there. I have a few tools in there and usually a couple little engine parts uh, just in case the engine messes up and I have to real quick fix that. Um, you take out a toolkit every day uh, when you're on the boat. It's We just use those ammo cans that are filled with everything that would need be to break that engine down, fix it, whatever can be. Um, extra spark plugs, um, a little filter that just in case there gets water or something in the gasoline. So 
Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that, you know, a lot more that goes into that. I don't think a lot of clients see that we take on the everything that goes in the boat that's with us. So, so basically yeah. you're carrying around the stuff like a guy who owns an older model, model Harley Davidson. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I have one everything friend. to fix it if it just broke down on the lake. <laughs> I have one friend who bought a brand new Harley, and the first thing he did was change it from a belt to a chain because he's like, I can fix a chain on the side of the road. I can't order a new belt on the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, that's good. And that's what we keep paracord inside there just in case of I've had pulleys where as soon as you pulled on it, the whole thing comes out and the engine's not even started. And you're like, oh, well, let's take this apart and we're going to put a new string on it right here. <laughs> so, you know, paracord is something that is extremely versatile. I keep that in my kayak. If you've got a little tarp in there and you need to build a shelter, you can tie that paracord up and drape that, that over it or make a lean to with it. You know, I mean, I don't think enough people realize just how much that can save your hind end. Mm -hmm. oh yeah i uh i usually keep a in one of the big rolls of like 500 yards mm -hmm. that's always stuffed in my bag um even my little fishing pack that i carry uh when i go fishing around here just day hikes and stuff i keep some paracord inside there just on the off chance of anything you know it's it, it's an amazing stuff and um i've actually been managed to um take it out and i did a little kind of survival thing and i took some out and you know made a fishing hook and mm -hmm. caught fish off the little white strands inside there like you know it's extremely you know useful for everything yeah. so i forget which beer company it is but i saw that they have directions on their can of how to take the tab and they're pre-serrated so you can pop them off and make a hook i saw that i think there's a few soda companies starting to do that yeah. now i thought that was yeah that was pretty awesome yeah. so. <laughs> now that is just neat and then these guys that have the uh, bracelets made out of paracord, but they've actually got hooks inside the bracelet too, so that you can take yep. everything out. And then it's got a fire starter for the class mechanism. And, you know, yep. you know, you laugh at those things, but you never know when that might be something you need to have. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, um, I have a few clients that they'll wear them when they're out there on the water. They're like, they're like, these are so cool. I saw this. And then they're like, you know, this is actually useful. Like if we get stranded out here, I'm like, well, if I don't have paracord, we may be using your bracelet to start the engine. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not just for looks. You come out your way, right? Yep. I know I've had to make a stringer out of paracord before. <laughs> I've done that myself. <laughs> uh-huh. Make a loop in one end and like find an old key. Everybody's got a key on their key ring. They don't know what it's for. And you yep. tie that on the other end and you run it through the loop and you've got a little stringer. <laughs> yep that's good uh, so andrew i mean professional guide obviously up in, in alaska so where do you, where does one such as yourself like to uh vacation or you know fishing in other waters what's um you got any bucket list places that you're thinking about bucket list um one big one on my bucket list right now is the olympic peninsula um i would love to go out there and chase steelhead for the winter uh on a spay rod uh, i have a friend that i work with who guides uh out in oregon and he's like i'm only you know i'm not that far from it so you come on out we'll head out there and he, he guides a lot for uh steelhead too but um to me, steelhead are just, they're an amazing fish species, you know, a rainbow that decided that I'm going out to the ocean and then coming back is, you know, the, the amount of travel that they, they go through and all that. And, um, any fish that, you know, goes out to the sea and comes back to freshwater, like sockeye silvers, they almost kind of come in, uh, not to down them in any way, but like, kind of like drones. A lot of them look alike. They come in the thousands Whereas stillhead tend to come in, each one's kind of unique. They have different scars, spot patterns, uh, colorations. Um, that's that's one big one on my bucket list, possibly for next year, to head out there and spend about a month and a half uh, chasing stillhead. So, yeah. but that's a that'd be a big one. And then uh, I'd love to uh, head down to uh, South America and go fishing down there, um, more specifically down to the Rio Grande and chase the big sea run browns that come in there so gosh yeah. yeah i have a few that are on my there's a lot more on my bucket list but there are some that i'm never going to get to so <laughs> but 
You know, I was so, talking with the saltwater specialists, and ironically enough, one of those guys is from Missouri too. Um, but they were talking about, I guess they've got a, a place that they're hooked up with a friend who has a place down in South America, and they go after those, I guess they're a type of piranha, but they eat like nuts. And so you basically just throw out a really big yeah. hook with something hard around it, and you catch them, and <laughs> evidently those things are, are incredible. <laughs> I've seen pictures of those online and stuff. Yeah, those look um, those look pretty amazing. And uh, looking at some of the flies that they toss for them, not a lot different from like the carp flies I throw during the summertime and early spring for the carp around here when they're eating on the seeds and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, I got this. I can do this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's absolutely amazing the crossover in flies. Yes, definitely. Um, I, uh, I met a guy, uh, it's been such a long time ago, um, at, the, at the fly shop over here in Lebanon, Missouri, and uh, he was showing pictures. We were in there. It was a big group of us, but he had just come back from South America, and uh, he was down there fishing for peacock. And he's like, the first peacock I caught on was this giant woolly bugger that the guy threw on there. <laughs> he's like, the same thing I'd throw for bass back here. He's like... Next time, I'm just taking a, you know all my bass flies down there with me. So, <laughs> you know, and that's I know Adam's had this before. I have guys will say, "Can you help me separate my fly box between trout flies and bass flies?" And I'm like, "Well, you're going to have one only for trout, and you're going to have one for big bass, and then you're going to have everything else in the other one." I'm like, "It's not an either or situation." Yeah. <laughs> um. Exactly. Yeah. I open up my streamer box and. uh especially this happened. I know I talked to you about this out in Montana. Um, all the guys were like, those are like pike flies and stuff. I'm like, no, those, those are all trout flies. Like they will catch trout. I promise you. <laughs> yeah. I know that's what Adam's been. He's been going fishing a lot lately. And how was your success been? And what kind of flies have you been using for those trout the last couple of weekends? Um, it's been a variety, but a lot of it's just, a lot of it's nymphing. It's nothing too crazy. Um, a lot of just, you know, there's a, a fly that I really like, uh, started tying. It's a, it's a geo two. It's got just brass head to it, a little bit of green, red coloring to it. Uh, it seems to do extremely well, um, from what I've been fishing. Um, and then, you know, you touched on it before we said it's the ultimate versatile fly. I mean, buggers are always getting it done in, in some capacity. Uh, that's yeah. what I've been using, for, you know, just recently for stuff around here. Nothing too crazy, but it's it's working. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, you know, that crossover and stuff like that. Now, um, nymphing up there, I assume you guys do. Uh, with a lot, when you're guiding, you're using a lot of indicators to help the guys, to, one, to keep it in the right water column, and two, to help the guys that may not free nymph a lot. Yeah, use a lot of indicators. Um, nymphing up there, uh, at least in the area that I'm at, we actually we there's only a few certain streams that we actually do it on that have enough of an insect population. Most all of them have somewhat, but a lot of the smaller streams will be the ones that we nymph on. Uh, there's only about four or five that I really like. I make sure my nymph box is with me. Um, but yeah, a lot of the rest of them, they're just so open water that um, I just, I never bring my nymph box, but uh, indicators, yeah, of course, um, just kind of helps me judge my boat when I'm, when I'm rowing it too, with indicators out there, how fast, how their drift is going and everything like that. So um, yeah, I prefer you know, specific, um, indicators. <laughs> yeah. Do you have like a, a specific brand or style of indicator? That's one of those things that you stop and think about it, the the variety of them that are out there, some of them are, they're expensive for what they are. I mean, floating, yeah. floating bobbers. And, um, and then some of them are just, you know, the, the little styrofoam stick on ones that, you know, gunk up your fly line and whatnot. I mean, there's just such a variety. Is there a specific type that you prefer that you guys use while you're up there? I wouldn't say so much of a, it's kind of, it comes of what I can get to the lodge the fastest to do what I can. Uh, I do prefer airlock um, yeah. just because I can slide those up easy. It's quick, throw it on. I can adjust the length super quick and have them back in the water. Um, 
but then it comes later in the year you're, you're starting to lose your airlock and all your indicators and you're kind of looking around it's like um what do i have to for indicators right now <laughs> so are you allowed to use a hopper dropper setup up there Yes, I, I have before. I've actually successfully caught and fish on a hopper up there. Um, not a whole lot. Uh, a lot of them, I think, think it's just a big stone fly rather than, you know, a hopper. Um, early spring, I see a lot of stone flies, especially around our lodge itself. Um, but my favorite, like, big, you know, terrestrial is a big chubby Chernobyl. Yep. Is Like, I will throw that all day long you know, little nymph underneath that, something a little shiny flash on there. And that's like my go to setup for a uh, a dry net dropper. So yeah. Yeah. I'm not opposed to throwing a mop fly or a squirmy wormy, but by golly, yep. I won't use an indicator. I'll put a <laughs> hopper on there just so <laughs> I'm not using an indicator. <laughs> <laughs> Turning up the nose to the indicator. You know, and, I'm, uh, I'm such a snob. <laughs> Yep. That's a uh, Morris hopper pattern, Sean, that you and I have, we've tied now oh. for a while um, from River Road Creations. That's a, that's a great um, hopper to use as an indicator. I've, I've done that multiple times yep. and I've caught several fish with it as well, but you tie it in those really bright. I've got one that's a really bright pink. It's got some black and yellow to it, man. You can see that thing a mile away. You know what? I retied. I hadn't tied one in a while. I retied a stealth bomber. Oh, yeah. And, man, I just, I've got to fish that more. It's just such a good-looking fly. And, uh, you know, I don't think it'd be great for a hopper dropper scenario because of the way it's designed to do. But, man, I think in the summertime, a big trout would absolutely love those. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you on that. Yeah. I haven't tied one of those in quite some time, but they're a lot of fun, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's and River Road Creations. I mean, they they're a friend of the show. Um, they don't sponsor us. They give us some free stuff, which is always great. But um, <laughs> man, they've just got some some awesome stuff. If you're don't want to use an indicator, you know, and it's so yeah. much easier to tie those up when you have those cutouts, and they're mm-hmm. not that expensive for the work that goes into them. Mm-hmm. They are hard yeah. to find now, though. They are. Uh, with COVID, they wound up having to, I guess, like shut down the the shop with all the people. And so it was down to just Tony and uh, he was really cranking it out and his orders have doubled from one distributor. So Golly. if you find them, buy them is what I'm saying, <laughs> you know, okay, yeah. I'll keep it. but, but pickings but are I've slim seen a right lot now. Of a lot of flight, too. Yeah, they like a lot of fly shops. Yeah, I know. You Nick, know, with this COVID. Yeah, oh, Nick, sorry. <laughs> oh, go, I, I was just gonna say Nick Dooley, Dooley's Fly Fishing dot, or yeah, Dooley's Fly Fishing dot com. Uh, you can save fifteen percent with promo kayak. He said he can't keep them in stock, so you know he says he gets them in, and like a day later they're gone because people are waiting on them, wanting them. But you can yeah. get fifteen percent off with promo code kayak. There we go. I'm going to have to go on there tonight. <laughs> oh, I'm going to tell you what, man. It's great. I mean, anytime you get to 15% off. And, you know, shipping's like 4 bucks, but, I mean, you spend, you know, a little bit of money. And most of us are going to buy, if we're going to have it mailed to us, 40 or 50 bucks at a time. Well, now your shipping's free plus an additional discount. Yeah. So That was the, the worst thing I ever hear about online is, oh, is a discount code. And then I'm like, well, I, I have to now. I'm losing money if I don't buy this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like i was ordering uh fly time material last night and it kept popping up if you spend this much more you get this much more you know off and i'm just like well now i have to you know <laughs> yeah can't leave Twist that money on the table yeah. yeah and then before you know it i'm like oh i got like a 600 hundred dollar bill i'm like well that'll be enough for tonight you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i tell you what there's nothing like um if you've had a little too many beers and then you get on the fly store website that it's amazing what you decide you need. Yep. <laughs> if you have way too many beers, you get surprised when the box shows up in the mail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you think someone's I've had that you happen something. This is great. And then you check your bank statement and go, oh, it was me. Yeah. 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 I've always said they need to have a breathalyzer on Amazon. <laughs> 
That might hurt the bottom That could be the next million dollar uh, idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many people I've talked to. They're like, well, I had a few too many last night and ordered some stuff on Amazon. It's like, <laughs> it's like the infomercials, how they <laughs> just, they always do them late at night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That was a, that's another big dangerous thing uh, when I first started out guiding uh, is when you start out guiding and you start to get all these different pro deals from different companies that are like, you know, you sign up for and all that. And, you, and then you get this discount. I have so much fishing gear in different boxes that I'm like, I'm never going to use this. But I'm like, you know, they gave me this deal if I bought this and this came free when I signed up. So I'm like, I'm taking it all. <laughs> And every guide will warn you. And um, one of the guides I work with, he said, the truest statement is like, I will warn you. He's like, but you will spend in your first year of guiding all of your salary on fishing gear that you will never use. <laughs> He's like, you'll be broke, but you'll have the best gear around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. that's Unfortunately, that's the way it is. It's like, I would never buy a rod that's this expensive. But I get 75% off, so I'm going to go ahead and buy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I know uh, a guy I work with was on one of the one of the online stores, and he comes up to me. He's all excited. He's like, "A TFO uh, NXT combo is only a hundred and I think it was a hundred and nineteen dollars." I looked at him like, "Buy that bad boy," <laughs> you know, <laughs> because you're not going to get that deal. <laughs> you know? Oh no, definitely. Yeah, no. and uh, it's just one of those funny things where you're sitting there. It's like I'm sitting there going, "Do I need another eight weight?" Because let me see. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I have like four in my room right now that i'm just like oh i don't even have like <laughs> i have like three spay rods uh two five weights i got a couple of six weights an eight weight a nine weight and then i have rods that are still sitting up at the lodge in alaska that are just sitting there that i i left i was like i bought them and I'm like i can't pack all this home with me <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got a label maker up there putting your name on everything <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> the plane always looks funny on me because i'll have like eight rod tubes strapped to my back and they're like um you're gonna have to open all those i'm like okay here we go <laughs> That's got to uh, be. You're taking all of these? I'm like, yep. <laughs> I never thought about that when you're flying. I mean, I know I get a lot of four-piece fly rods because they're easier to pack in and out, and they go on an overhead. Um, but I never thought about trying to go through TSA with that many fly rods. Yeah. Um, if I have, I found that if I have more than three on my backpack, um, they'll want you to open them. But usually if I have only one or so on there – They'll pass it right through the little scanner, and it goes. They won't ever say anything. But uh, it was this past year that I had a couple strapped to my back, and they were like, um, "We're gonna need to look inside those and just double check everything." So, yeah, and they've but, got um, a difficult job, than, so you can't really begrudge them for it. I mean, there are, you know, it's a difficult yeah. job. Yeah, yeah. And let's face it, people flying are never nice. <laughs> everybody's got somewhere to be and they're always late. Yeah. It's just the nature of it. You know, out yeah. of all of those rods you have, Andrew, is there a particular one that you find that you either you enjoy fishing with the most, or maybe it's the one that you just, it's your go-to no matter what. My go-to no matter what that, that'd be a difficult one. Um, it would be my six weight that I have. And I have a, a really fast action, uh, six weight. It's a, it's a sage. And, uh, I really, I love that rod to pieces. Um, I like throwing the faster action rod, uh, just being able to, you know, bullet something right out there where I need it to be. Um, and then I love fishing the six weight, uh, just in general, a lot. Um, it can handle a lot of those bigger flies, but it's still a light enough rod that you're not going to overpower something and kind of lose some of the enjoyment when you get one of those smaller fish on the end of your line. So is there a brand of fly rod you like more than another? Um, not really in particular. Uh, I, I'm a fan of Sage. Uh, they're faster action rods, uh, but I love Echo. Um, I have several of their rods. I have a Fenwick. Um, I have a couple of really old uh, Shakespeare fly rods that are like eight, nine pieces, and it's like seven foot long. <laughs> um I have, I wouldn't say I have a brand in particular that I like more than anything. Um, 
but I'd say I I lean a little bit more towards faster action rods. Um, but with most companies, you know, they have you know a rod in every kind of speed, you know, slow, medium, fast. So there's no easier way to pick a fight among fly fishermen than to ask their favorite rod or their favorite line. <laughs> yeah, very true. <laughs> everybody has such a, a, a diehard opinion about all that. And, uh, I always kind of looked at it as, um, a lot of these companies, you know, with fly rods, uh, especially, uh, which I found out this a few years ago, um, they can't really patent any of their specific designs on there. So when a new fly rod hits the market, a lot of these other companies can copy it if they want and, you know, completely get away with it. Um, one of the one fly shop I go to a lot, Reading's Fly Shop over in Lebanon, mm -hmm. Lebanon uh, he made fly rods for a long time. And like he said, you know, I'd come out with something new that was kind of all mine and unique. And then a year later, three other companies have kind of copied that. So that's the way I've always looked at it is, you know, a lot of these rod companies, they, there is a, you know, they're all kind of general based. They all have something unique about them. But I mean, you know, it, it comes down to personal preference more than anything but and then with lines you know the all lines are you know you you have the cheaper sets of lines but you know if it floats and it catches you fish then there's no need to get into a fight on the riverbank because somebody's you know has an orvis line and you prefer rio or have a rio line so <laughs> yeah i know one of the great things uh pablo's doing down there at uh, bajuco flats you know, um, my fiberglass, or not my fiberglass, my uh, graphite rod that he built me, a one weight, you know, it's just a generic blank. And he can do that. But he also was licensed to buy, like, TFO and Sage. And the TFOs yeah. come with the same exact warranty. You know, so yeah. if you want a TFO rod like a mangrove, but you want to customize it with certain colors and stuff, you can do that. And I think that's really neat. Um, because it allows you to have a little bit more say in what you're doing um, and not paying yeah. anything extra. Yeah. So. Uh, a lot of characters. Yeah. I've, I've seen a few people um, up there that have, you know, different colors built into their rods and everything. And I think that's, you know, amazing to do. Um, one of these days I'm going to have a rod, rod custom built. I've, uh, I've looked at, you know, Pablo and I've looked at a few other places that do custom rod builds and all that. One of these days I'm going to get around to, you know, finally being able to do that. But then I'm kind of worried that once I do, you know, have something custom made up for me, I'm not going to want to fish it because I'm like, it's too pretty. We're going to leave it behind there. You know, we're not going to fish with it. Well, Adam had Pablo mark every inch on his fly rod so he could take a picture of the fish. But unfortunately, he asked Pablo to mark the inches at the half inch point so all of his fish were double the length. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's that's brilliant. I'm gonna have to. Right? Yeah, I need that tape, tape measure like that too. So that's that's how Adams win in all these tournaments. <laughs> Secrets out now. Brilliant. You just ruined me. Yeah, he's got one with the, uh, every inch marked at a half inch, one at three quarter, and one regular. So he just takes the same fish and gets three different pictures with it. <laughs> that's awesome. You that's just, brilliant. You just, flip there. The, you just flip the fish. Yeah. Just, so you get you get you get both sides of it. Yeah, you gotta give that different spot pattern there that's exactly right yeah exactly right yeah um, i have heard of guys taking their hog trough though and doing that marking it down by like a quarter of an inch and so they've got two so every fish they catch they're they're marking two fish no kidding and one bigger than it actually yeah. is i've i have heard that there is some there are some nightmare stories about folks like that out there on those tournaments you've got to watch Gosh. people I've heard a few stories. I've heard uh, a few stories about like up in Minnesota and stuff about that during the muskie tournaments, guys marking fish that are like, you know, they're saying it's 30, 40 pounds. And then you look at the picture and the fish is like that big around. And it's just like, um, no, I don't think that's 30. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't know how much lead shot they put in it before they weighed it. Yeah. <laughs> that's I actually, so, um, our, our local uh, around here in Cedricsville, they do a farm pond tournament. Um, and a few years back, there was somebody that did get caught with that by stuffing lead weight into the fish because um, they do a big fish fry at the end. And a lot of times they'll cut up the fish and fry them that they, they bring in. Well, when they cut into one of them, there was a chunk of lead in its gut. <laughs> oh, 
Oh my god. That was probably one of my former <laughs> students. <laughs> was it Johnny? Was it Johnny? I don't think it was Johnny, you know. <laughs> oh. But I could not believe it. I'm like, man, that that poor fish, you know. <laughs> oh, man. I like to know how hard, you know, like, you know, but yeah. how hard they I had to shove that, that down in there. Sweating that out too. Just knowing like Please don't cut up my fish. Please don't cut up my fish. Please don't cut up my fish. And just knowing, just knowing what's about to happen. Oh. Yeah. Gosh. You know, a farm pond tournament, that would, you know, or, I mean, I think anywhere, that would be a great thing for guys to do. I mean, that's, you always look at, and not necessarily with a cash prize or anything, but just where you can get a group of guys together and, and take those photos and do something like that just to, you know, because sometimes camaraderie in that way is a good time, but you definitely don't have to have to participate in those events. Yeah, it's a lot of fun every year that they do it down here. Um, there's a big fish fry. Like, there's usually, like, I want to say, like last last year, I want to believe there was like forty or fifty people in on it, but so wow. many people showed up after the tournament and just you know sat around and fried up fish and talked. I mean. It's usually always a great time. So, and then so of course that, Sedge, it was you know big party. So like, uh, <laughs> is it one like one farm pond, or is it like in a particular area? There's a certain amount. Like, how does that work exactly? How, I mean, farm ponds. I think they like, all shapes and sizes. So, what do you talk like? Yeah. What did it look like? It kind of the way the rules go um, is you know go fish whatever farm pond you want to. Um, it's just when you bring the fish back for the weigh in, they have to be alive now. Um, they have to be, you know, be able to put them in a tank of water and they can swim around. So that's yeah. their big rule there is no dead fish brought in because, you know, you never know if, if they caught it that day or went and bought the fish and just, you know, defrosted it just in got the that water. Guy so, about to win me a $50 yep. prize. <laughs> they froze it and stuffed it full of lead. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but oh. I mean, it, it's usually a good time, and uh, you usually never hear. I, I heard that story years ago, um, and that was really the only one I ever heard about them having like an incident with something on. So, yeah, well, after was... that, you know, it was no one really cared really much of prize money, like, it's like people are really risking everything for so. <laughs> Well, we all but know it was it's, Johnny. It's so. kind of a good old boy. Yeah, you know, Johnny excluded. We don't, you know. <laughs> um, one of the but. things, speaking of Johnny, um, is he's starting to tie some flies. And uh, are you going to be showing him the ropes on that? Or are you going to be guiding him out there on some of the local creeks? Or do people hit you up? Do your friends hit you up a lot to take them fishing? Uh, every now and then someone will hit me up, you know, like, hey, uh, what should I get? Um, I find the biggest thing that people ask me now about is like brands and stuff that I prefer. Um, Johnny's been texting me some about, you know, he got his fly tying kit in and then he was like, uh, so you want to come over sometime and, you know, show me some flies to tie up and all that. And which I'm always up for that. I'm like, yeah, let's, you know, we'll crack open a couple beers, sit down and we'll crank out some flies, you know, and have a good old time. But um, I haven't really had it had anybody like hey let's you know you're gonna be my guide for the day as far as you know friends wise so i've had a few people that are like i'm raiding your your fishing gear for the day so <laughs> we all love those but, friends that when we get on the water they uh immediately go to your fly box and start looking at your selection yeah like hey what you got in there like i'm a little low on stuff um let me borrow some of yours for the day <laughs> And then they end up keeping the fly at the end of the day. <laughs> right. Yeah. Borrow. Yeah. Yeah. I'll borrow that. <laughs> uh, then you never get it back. They're like, oh, I lost that in a tree or something. You know, it's like, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gonna... Go ahead, Adam. No, I, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I've got a friend who spin fishes with an ultralight. And he'll, he's got these great big spinners, these inline spinners. And he'll grab my flies so he can cast them on his ultralight. I'm like, dude, <laughs> I did big streamers that I've tied. And he's putting spinners on them and just fishing the hell out of them. 
<laughs> oh, good times. Uh, yeah. 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 So, uh, guys, we're uh, this is going to be a rather long episode, and we push the two together. Uh, we got some final remarks, Adam. You got some final questions you want to ask? I don't. You know, I, I don't really have too much more, Andrew. I mean, you've been a pleasure to speak with, and uh, uh, it's, it's good to get on here and chat with you guys. For let me let me thanks for letting me crash your party first and foremost. Uh, just <laughs> hopping in here, it's always good to talk to somebody with some different experience, which is really cool. You're always welcome on here. Um, for those of you who uh, maybe we used to stream live, um, we had a lot of issues uh, the last couple of months where one guest was scheduled to come on and he was in an automobile accident. Another guest was scheduled to come on and he <laughs> hurt himself and was at the ER. And so we went to the pre recorded. Oh. Um, but this allows us to put the podcast both on the Kayak Flyer uh, Facebook page and on the Kayak Flyer YouTube. So if you want to watch the show and see what we all look like, you can. And, of course, you can always download the show wherever you download podcasts by just going to Kayak Flyer. So depending on how you enjoy the show or maybe you want to see the show, I know um, Chris Ellis was just on um, the show that dropped the 25th, 26th, and Chris wound up tying a fly while he was on air. So those guys that watched it got to see one of his favorite crab patterns for uh, redfish. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic that we've got with the show. And then, of course, um, our great sponsors that support us. We try and put their logos on the screen. Um, guys like Dooley, uh, Nick Dooley over at Dooley'sFlyFishing.com, that 15% promo code with uh, Kayak. We like to go ahead and let those guys have some time on the show and whatnot. And uh, it's I, I'm, I'm liking the change because we can record a little bit more often. And that way we don't have an episode or something happens. I did. We've had a lot of requests for Drew Gre Gregory. Um, I reached out to a friend who knows Drew, um, waiting to hear back. So that's going to be a big episode. And Adam, I know you'll want to be on for that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you bet. So, you know, Andrew, this has been great. Um, I can't wait. I know we were talking beforehand. Yeah. We're going to go trout fishing this summer. If Adam can get down here, we'll take him with us uh, down to Arkansas. Um, yeah, you. you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of great places down there. And I know you're talking about, you know, looking at guiding down there, at least in the wintertime. Uh, so the best of luck with that. I think it would be great. That's just a, a resource that is not getting used enough. And like you said, guys in Montana talk yeah. about how great it is down there. So yeah. fly over you know, country. It's, it's an amazing area that, you know, yeah. you know, people coming from Florida everywhere to the middle of the Ozarks to go fishing in the dead of winter. So. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what's so funny is in the dead of winter, we're going down south to get out of the cold, and they're coming up here to go fishing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're smart enough to stay in the warm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, guys, this has been absolutely wonderful. I'm um, Sean and uh, Adam. Uh, here with me again. Thank you so much. Andrew, you've been a pleasure to have on the show. I know we'll have you on here again. I mean, you just live down the street, literally. Um, so I'm sure we'll be talking again. Best of luck. You want to go ahead and plug the lodge you're working at? I know they're booked up, but go ahead and plug it so people can check it out. Yep, It is the Royal Coachman Lodge, Bristol Bay, Alaska, and you can go on sweetwatertravel.com. Head on there. Uh, Pat Vermillion and Scott Schumacher send them an email or give them a call uh, about booking uh, for one of the many other lodges too that we have. Um, give them a shout anytime. They're in the office five days a week. So head on over, just tell them Andrew Montgomery sent you. So, yep. And that's really cool. You guys have multiple places so you can look and see at which place you'd like to go to Adam, anything yep. final? No, that's it. It's been a pleasure guys. All right. We're going to give away a cutthroat yeah. furled leader. Um, I think this week we're going to look at YouTube comments. So sit down on YouTube and leave a comment about an experience you had with a guide or a trip you would like to have with a guide. Maybe there's a, a place you want to go, um, whether it be Cotter, Alaska, Montana, South America, wherever you're thinking about Central America, leave us a comment, let us know, and we'll draw a winner and, uh, we'll, uh, I'll, 
message whoever it is and we'll get them a cutthroat furled leader and remember you can always get a cutthroat furled leader 15 percent off with promo code kayak all right guys this is sean and adam with andrew thank you guys so much and join us next week